Uh, thank you very much for reminding me, Prabhu. Okay, so as we know, there are 12 months in a year and uh, Krishna says that of all those 12 months, Karthik is most dear to me. Some people say, wait a minute, in a different place, he said, Pushottam Mas is the most dear to me. And uh, yes, Pushottam Mas is very, very dear to him. But there's a reason why Karthik is more dear to Krishna. And that reason is that Karthik is the month of Radharani. So therefore, nothing compares with Karthik Mas. Okay, give me a second. I'm going to mute everyone. So once again, please keep yourself unmute unless you have to speak. So unmute, speak, then mute again, please. So Krishna says, um, and it's mentioned in uh, Padma Puran, that just like of all the plants, which plant is most dear to Krishna? Anybody? Yeah. Tulsi. 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 Yes. Tulsi. Tulsi, yes, absolutely. And uh, of all the places of pilgrimage, Dwarka is most dear to Krishna. And of all the days, days, which day is most dear to Krishna? Anyone? Uh, Ekadashi. Ekadashi. Very good, yes, Ekadashi. So he says, just like that, Karthi is most dear to me. Then he says, of the best, of the yugas, what what you guys the most dear to Krishna? Anybody? Satya Yuga. Satya Yuga, absolutely. Among all the scriptures, Vedas are most dear to Krishna. Among all the rivers, which river is the most dear? Yamuna. Ganga. Ganga. Ganga, yes. Ganga. Ganga. Uh, so just, just like that, Kartik is most dear to me. So this is from uh, Shikanda Purana, actually. Now, another reason is that the quality of a place, quality of time or month, for example, or day is described as higher or lower based on the past times of Lord Krishna that's happening. So if you know um, Nectar of Instruction, that is a book written by Srila Rupa Goswami. There he says, Dwarka is superior to Vakunthi. Dwarka is superior to Vaikuntha, but Vrindavan is, sorry, Mathura is superior to Dwarka. And then Vrindavan is superior to Mathura. And then Govardhan Hill is superior to Vrindavan. And Radha Kund is superior even to Vrindavan. There's nothing more superior than that. Why? Because the quality of past times that happened there. So, for example, in Vaikuntha, there is basically no Madhuri Bhav. Very, very small amount. Have you ever seen uh, Lord Narayan or Lord Vishnu putting his arms around Mother Lakshmi? No, because it doesn't happen. Have you ever seen some, you know, mischief happening between Mother Lakshmi and Lord Narayan? No, because it doesn't happen. Sujata Mataji, can you please mute yourself? I'm just going to do it again. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in Dwarka, there is there is some Madhuri Bhav. Not a whole lot, but definitely more than uh, in uh, Vaikuntha because you hear, you read about loving conversations between Mother Lukmini, for example, Mother Satyabhama, and Lord Krishna. And so there is some degree of Madhuri there. Even though the sense that Krishna is Supreme Personality of Godhead is very strong. In Mathura, there's more Madhuri than Dwarka, but not a whole lot. But there is definitely more. So therefore superior to Dwarka. Then Vrindavan is all Madhuriya. 
is no Aishwarya. So therefore, it is superior to Mathura. And we hear, hear and read about all sorts of mischiefs and, and wonderful pastimes that happen between Radharani, Gopis, and Lord Krishna. But the pastimes on Govardhan Hill have been more sweet and confidential than Vrindavan. And then, of course, Rathakun is the, considered the um, personification of, of liquid form of Radharani's love for Krishna. And there's nothing higher than that. So therefore, it's the highest. So that's basically uh, what I'm trying to say is that the quality of pastime determines the superiority of a place or time or date. So the pastimes in Karthik, can anybody tell me, remind me, what are the pastimes that happen in the month of Karthik? Yeah. Anyone? Go ahead. Lifting Go, Govardhan, okay. What else? Damodar Leela. Damodar Leela, of course. What else? Rasa dance. Rasa dance. Rasa dance, absolutely. Radha Kund appearance. Radha Kund appearance, absolutely, yes. What else? Gopashtami. Gopashtami, yes, yes. Tulsi Viva. Yes, Tulsi Viva, yes. So th those are basically the past time. There are some festivals that also happen. What are the festivals? Diwali. Diwali, yes. And just Nandotsav. Nandotsav. Nandotsav, yes. Absolutely, I yeah, forgot about that. Nandotsav. And just before Diwali, something called Dhan Teras. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. So, so there's a lot of festivals and a lot of pastimes which determine the quality of or superiority of the month of uh, Karthik. It's also very, very important in other ways. And therefore, uh, we say that certain things must be done during this month. So for example, uh, it is said that anything auspicious we do is magnified by factor of 1000 compared to other months. So therefore, the devotees increase their chanting, <clears throat> the number of rounds they do of Japa during this month. Um, actually, I'm not going to ask anybody to make any, any promises, but I would like you to consider increasing your rounds by at least one, if not four, what, compared to whatever you're doing today for this month. So think about that. And if you can, it will be very, very beneficial to, to you. A second thing is done is offering of the ghee lamp. So preferably once in the morning, once in the evening. Um, if you're not doing it, I would request you to definitely do that. Um, very, very important. You know, and, and also if you can offer incense and flowers, if you do arti, then, then you're fine. But offering of the lamp should be in addition to the arti that you do regularly. Um, very important to observe celibacy in this month, whether you're married or not. And uh, worship of Tulsi Maharani. That's another very, very important activity, a devotional activity that you perform. Um, Given charity if possible. And uh, consider performing some kind of austerity. So some people, for example, they say, I won't um, eat any sweets. Or they say, well, I usually end up watching something Bollywood, Hollywood, but I won't do that this month. You know, or anything, just think of anything, anything material that you say, I will not do. Uh, so for example, most, most people who have, uh, observe Chaturmasya, this is the month where we will not eat urat ki dal, uh, eggplants, um, there's something else, mustard oil, <clears throat> and some people also say no tomatoes, etc. So again, some austerity should be done because the, it's very auspicious uh, to do that. Um, that's all I can think of at this time. 
Um, yeah, oh yeah, one other thing. If at all possible, take your bath before sunrise every day of this month. Now I know it's hard for some people, but some people it's no problem. You do this all the time, uh, every day of the year. But for some who are not doing it, please consider doing that. So, and if you can't do the whole month, at least do the last three days of Karthik. Wake up early and, and do that. Okay, that's all I want to talk about Karthik. I didn't want to make a whole class about this. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, all right. Hare Krishna, Pita. Oh, Nandimukhi, Hare Krishna. Yes, yes go ahead. Pitashri, can you tell me why three days? No, this is a concession. Okay. This is a con okay. It should be 30 days. Okay. It's a concession. If you cannot do 30 days, do 10%. Okay. You know? <laughs> do three days. They said the last last three days, remember the last five days, Bhish Panchak? Which yes. again makes it even more auspicious. So you can okay. do at least three of those five days. So it's just like, you know, there's a saying in Hindi, it's called Bhagate Bhut ki Langoti Bhali. If you can get anything, at least get a little bit. So if you can do 30 days, okay. just do three days. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sure, you're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Can you can you talk a little uh, in brief about the importance of Chaturmasya? So actually, um, the way Chaturmasya started was in the old days, all the sannyasis, they would not stay in one place. They were constantly traveling. However, there were four months of rain, but travel became very difficult. So therefore, they made it a rule to, to stay in one place and increase their sadhana. So they would do things like no shaving, um, not because they wanted to look you know, ugly, but because there's the time you spend shaving, you can spend in doing extra rounds. So a lot of people even today, they don't shave for four months. That's one example. Similarly, in those four months, because of the weather, certain things are hard to digest. So therefore they said, okay, uh, first month, and I'm trying to remember what was it. Um, so like uh, last month was milk, month before was no yogurt. Um, green first, leafy vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sonam. First month was no green leafy vegetables, but they're hard to digest. So then there became a rule, you know, I don't do that. Um, so that's, that's basically uh, what it is. Uh, another way to perform some austerities and increase our sadhana. Okay, bro? Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Oh, gee. Why is uh, Vrindavan not Krishna's favorite? No, it's not that it's not his favorite. It is his favorite, but certain things are more favorite. So the, the quality of uh, sweetness of the pastimes and the confidential confidential uh, nature of the pastimes <coughs> is greatest at Radha, uh, Radha, Radha Kund. So therefore, otherwise, Vrindavan was very, very dear to Krishna. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the... Um, to the, what I was going to say, Srimad Bhagavatam itself. Now, you may recall two weeks ago, we talked about how Krishna killed Shalva, a demon, Dantavakra, another demon, and Dantavakra's brother, Vidurat. Dantavakra and Vidurat were killed in Mathura. And this is where he decided that I'm here. As you know, it's just across the river, Yamuna, and uh, 12, 12 miles only. So he decided to come visit Vrindavan. So, and then we talked about the whole pastime of his return and marriage, etc., uh, in Vrindavan. So we'll continue from that point onwards. We are on chapter 78, which was only half finished at the time of Krishna deciding to go to Vrindavan. And then we um, took a tangent to talk about uh, his marriage to Radharani and other gopis and then wrapping up the pastimes in Vrindavan. So that's where we are today. 
So now the, the change of topic in the same chapter, change of topic, and it's talking about Lord Balaram now. And it says that when Lord Balaram heard that there's going to be a Kurukshetra war between the uh, Pandavas and the Kauravas, he didn't want to participate in that. He said, I am neutral. I don't want to um, get involved in this. Uh, this is too political for me. And uh, he decided to leave Dwarka and go on a pilgrimage. And he went to many, many sacred places. All the names are given Bhagavatam. I didn't want to go through that. And eventually he came to a place, very famous place called Namisharanya Forest. So I hope all of you have heard that name, Namisharanya. Very, very famous. It's about 80 kilometers from Lucknow, my hometown. And um, uh, famous for so many things. And we'll talk. I think I gave a class some time ago about that. Anyway. So he went there. Oh, I guess the most famous activity there is that Shivad Bhagavatam was narrated at, um, at Namisharanya Forest by by whom? Sukadev Goswami. Uh, no. Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami, yes. Sutta Goswami. And, uh, excuse me. <coughs> where the 80,000 sages had uh, gathered and they were asking questions. That's how Shivad Bhagavatam starts. So that happened in Namashwarana forest. Anyway, so Lord Balaram showed up there and uh, same 80,000 sages that we hear about in Shivad Bhagavatam were sitting there performing or getting ready to perform an extended fire sacrifice that would have gone for years. So when they saw Lord Balaram come, they all got up. They offered their obeisances, welcomed him, offered him a nice seat of honor. And as he was being honored, Lord Balaram noticed that a person by the name of Roma Harshan Sut, who was the speaker in this assembly, he continued to sit on the speaker's seat even after seeing Lord Balaram, did not get up, and uh, did not offer uh, obeisances or any kind of respects. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he also noticed that even though Romarsan Sut was a, of a lower caste than the Brahmins there in the assembly, uh, he was sitting in a seat that was higher than theirs. And so he got so angry, he, uh, he was really offended. So he took a took a blade of grass, kusha grass, and simply touched Romarshan's suit with the tip of that blade of grass, and that killed Romarshan. Now, I just want to explain, um, do you know who sutas are, by the way? Does anybody know who sutas are? So, sutas are children born of... Uh, Riders. Ah, sorry. Chariot rider, drivers, something, Prabhu. Yeah. Who are so, born to Sudputra, you can say. Okay, so you're right. They are chariot drivers by profession. But typically they have a Kshatriya father and Brahmin mother, which is considered um, <clears throat> uh, not recommended in the scriptures kind of marriage. It should be father from a higher caste and mother from a lower caste or same caste. So this is considered opposite. In Sanskrit, they call it vilom, and therefore it's not considered good, and they're considered lower class people than, than uh, you know, Brahmins. <clears throat> and Brahmins and Kshatriyas as well. Um, anyway, um, so Ramachan Sut was from that caste. However, he was very qualified. He was a disciple of, um, of Srila Vyasadeva very, very well trained, very highly educated. And he was appointed by the sages to, to be the speaker. Um, by the way, so Namrata Mata was saying that the profession is chariot driver. They have one other uh, profession, which is storytelling, but not story, mundane stories. These are the stories of the scriptures. So Ram Harshan Sut was so qualified that he could narrate, and he was going to narrate Shimad Bhagavatam. Uh, to, to anyone, having learned from uh, Vishal Vyasadeva. Anyway, so um, 
Lord Balaram killed him. Now, the assembled sages were very disturbed by what just happened. And they very respectfully explained to Lord Balaram that it was actually their own choice that they had appointed uh, Lom Hashan Sud to this position and given him a higher seat. But not only that, they had just promised him and blessed him with long life and freedom from physical pain as long as the sacrifice continues. So they said, we just blessed him to have a very long life when you came and killed him. And they said, well, we know that you did this unknowingly. And we also know that you are Supreme Personality of God and you're above the Vedic injunctions. But what we're requesting you is that please set a perfect example for the general public. And please atone for this sin of killing the Sutta Goswami. Lord Balaram very humbly accepted their point. And he said, please tell me how to best atone for this killing that I have done. And then he said, if you want, I have the power to revive this person and, and restore everything you promised him. Long life, strength, you know, sensory power, all those kind of things. But the sages said, no, 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 no. Just please see to it that somehow, just do something, that somehow your power and the power of your kusha grass weapon, as well as our promise of long life and Rome Hunter's death, they all remain intact. So like, although they're contradictory apparently, but they should all come true. So Lord Brown said, hmm, interesting. And he said, okay, the Vedas say is a word they use maxim. So Vedic maxim is that one's son takes birth as one's own self. So therefore, he said, let's appoint Rom Hashan's son. Anybody knows his name? First name. Ugrashava. So Ugra Shiva Sut, <coughs> excuse me, let's appoint him as the speaker of the Puranas. Um, and just like the, the um, sages had promised his father, Ugra, Ugra Shiva's father, long life, he blessed Ugra Shiva to have long life and, and uh, um, uh, his health, and the Bhagavatam said, unfailing sensory power. So that happened. So, uh, Ugrishwa Sud got appointed as the speaker. And as we know, then he spoke the whole Bhagavatam to them. But Lord Balram wanted to do something more for the sages. So he said, is there anything else I can do for you? And they talked about a demon whose name was Balwal. It's kind of funny, Bhagavad says, Balwal, the son of Ilwal. Anyway, um, and this Balwal would, as soon as these sages will start the fire sacrifice, he'll come and start shouting the place of sacrifice with pus, urine, stool, etc., etc. You know, and disturbed them so much, they were not able to do their fire sacrifice. So he um, said, no problem, I'll take care of that. And um, um, I said, also, I will, based on your advice, I'll go on another year of pilgrimage to all these holy places in India, but I'll wait until the new moon so I have the opportunity to kill this demon Balwal. So I'm going to pause here for a second, see if there are any questions or comments before I move on. Okay, silence means no, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so uh, does the demon, they, he killed at the same time or he comes back and kills that? Uh, so, so I'm just getting to that. I'm just, just give me 30 okay, seconds, I'll get to that. Anyone else? Okay, all right, I'll keep going. So just as Ratha uh, 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 who asked, so he said, I'll wait until the new moon. 
So there was, I don't know how many days, but there were some days. Um, but the reason was uh, that it was usually on new moon day that this demon will come up here and cause all the disturbance. So sure enough, on the next new moon day, um, suddenly the, a very harsh wind started to blow in the sacrificial arena. And suddenly there was this unbelievably obnoxious smell of pus and, and urine and, and, uh, and uh, stool and all that. And the dust was so thick that you couldn't see anything. All you could feel was this uh, smell, foul smell. And next came the downpour of you know, pus, urine, stool, etc., into the arena. And then the demon appeared. Big trident in his hand, massive body, pitch black in color. And his face was so frightening that everybody basically started running, except Lord Balram. And it was very huge. And it was flying in the air. And Lord Balram used his uh, plow to grab him by the neck, brought him down, and hit him with his club on his head, I mean, uh, with his club and killed him instantly. And then, of course, the, the wind stopped and all that. The sages came back. They honored Lord Balram for his uh, uh, act. They offered all sorts of sincere prayers and they blessed him. And then they performed a what's called a ritual bath for the Lord, presented him with a Vajanti garland. Um, and this garland had is made of lotuses, but lotuses that will never fade. And gave them gave Lord Balam lots of divine uh, garments and jewelry, etc. And uh, they said goodbye. So Lord Balam then left, started his pilgrimage, and he went to many, many holy holy places. Um, in one place, he met Augusta Rishi actually, and he offered him prayers and received his blessings. He continued to go, uh, continued traveling. And then he heard that the battle of Kurukshetra was almost finished. And so he decided to go there. But he got to Kurukshetra on the day that Bhim and Duryodhan were going to start fighting with their clubs. So when he saw that, he tried to stop them. Because remember, Duryodhan was uh, 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 Lord Balram's disciple. We talked about that three weeks ago. And uh, he had very soft corner for, for Duryodhana. And of course, he loved the Pandavas. So he didn't want this thing to go on. He also understood that uh, Bhim is very strong, stronger than uh, Duryodhana. Actually, it is said that um, Duryodhana had the strength of 8,000 elephants, whereas Bhim had the strength of 10,000 elephants. But Duryodhana was better trained and better skilled at fighting with the club. So he said, nobody's going to win this, this game, so please stop. But neither Bhim nor Duryodhan were interested in listening to the advice of Lord Balram, and so they continued to fight. So then Lord Balram said, well, listen, I think the fate has made this arrangement, fate meaning Krishna, and uh, I'm not going to be able to do anything here. So he left and went to, went to Dwarka. Sometime later, um, Balram went back to Namasharanya and there was a lot of, lot of uh, fire sacrifices performed on his behalf. And uh, Lord Balram blessed all the sages with uh, you know, transcendental knowledge. And actually he revealed to them his own eternal identity. So that was his trip to, second trip to Namasharanya. And now the topic changes again. So before I do that, I'm going to pause one more time and see if there are any questions or comments. No? Okay, all right. So then I'll move on. Now the next chapter talks about Sudama, the Brahmin Sudama. Um, and this uh, topic starts because uh, King Parishit said to Shukade Goswami, I would like to hear some other pastimes of Lord Krishna. So Sudama said, okay, fine, great. So we'll talk about Sudama. And he said Sudama was a personal boyhood friend of Lord Krishna. 
and uh, Sudama was very poor. And one of the reasons he was very poor was that not only he was spending all his time in serving Lord Krishna, uh, but he did go to work or go begging. So whatever came of his own accord, he will accept that. So they were really very, 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 very poor. Uh, there were times when they had nothing to eat. Uh, his wife never complained. But one day, she couldn't find any food to prepare for her husband. And she could see that he's very hungry, but not complaining. So she went to him and said, you know, you have a very wonderful friend in Krishna. He is the emperor. You know, why don't you go to him in Dwaraka and ask for some charity, you know, beg for some charity. You know, you're Brahmin, you're allowed to beg, and then he's your friend anyway. But Sudama was very reluctant. He said, I don't want to take undue advantage of my friendship with Krishna. But she persisted. So Sudama said to himself, you know, maybe this is a, this Krishna's desire. He wants me to go visit him. You know, I'll have this opportunity to see my old friend. So he said, okay, um, that's an auspicious thing. So therefore I'll go. And then he said to his wife, but I don't want to go empty handed. I need to give some kind of a gift to Krishna when I see him. They had nothing in the house. So his wife went out in the village begging for something, anything. Now, mind you, most people in the village were also very poor. So all she could get was um, a little bit of uh, chipped flat rice. So she took a you know old piece of rag, wrapped it all up uh, in that rag, gave it to his, her husband said, this is the gift, please give it to Lord Krishna. So he accepted it. And he walked all the way from, actually, anybody knows, those of, those of you who are from Gujarat, where did Sudama live? Porbandar. Yes, Porbandar, very good. Who said that? Sudevi. Oh, Hare Krishna, very nice. Yes, so, so, uh, so Porbandar to Dwarka, I think it's about two hour car ride. I don't know how long it takes to walk, but anyway, so he walked from Porbandar to, to Dwarka. I, as he approached the palace, he had to go through different gates that nobody was allowed to go through those gates without proper ID and permission and all that, but nobody stopped him. Somehow nobody stopped Sudama and he got all the way to the palace of Lord Krishna where he lived with his wife, Lukmani. Lord Krishna saw him from a distance. He was sitting on his wife's bed and he jumped up and ran to that main gate where Sudama was still walking through. And he went and gave a big hug. You know, like in Hindi, they say, you know, big, big hug for uh, Sudama, you know, and put his arms around him, arm, arm around him and brought him back inside the room where he was sitting with, um, with his wife, Lukmani. And he looked so happy, like his face was just effulgent, you know, more effulgent than usual with happiness to see his old friend. And he sat Sudama down on the bed of Lukmani, which is where he was sitting. And he washed Sudama's feet with his own hands. And then he sprinkled the water that he, for, that he used for washing. After the wash, he put the sprinkled the water on his head and on the head of every member of the family. After that, he gave Sudama lots of gifts and then offered a whole arti, incense, lamps, and all those kind of things to the arti of Sudama. And as he was doing the arti, Lukmani was fanning him, you know, Sudama. And now Sudama, you can imagine what Sudama was wearing. A dhoti with a bunch of holes on it, quite, no, <coughs> quite dirty, soaked in dust and all that. And, you know, so very shabbily dressed person. But there she was, goddess of Lakshmi herself, goddess Lakshmi herself, Mother Rukmini. She was finding with her charmer, uh, this Brahmin. Um, the residents of the palace, the security guards and other servants of the palace, they were just astonished, like, who is this person? Why is Lord Krishna treating him like a king? You know, uh, what did he do to deserve all this? They, they didn't know who Sudama is. <coughs> so they're all wondering, uh, what's going on? He said, he must have done some very, very pious activities 
in his previous life. And that's why Lord Krishna is so reverently, you know, <coughs> excuse me, dealing with him. It's like his own brother. Anyway, Lord Krishna took the hand of Sudama and sat down beside him. And they started reminiscing about their old, <coughs> excuse me, that's more, yeah. Uh, it was old days at the Gurukul of Sandipani Moon. It was a long time ago, you know, when they were there. <coughs> and then Krishna asked Sudama, well, did you get married? You know, do you have a wife who's compatible to your nature? And are you happy in your life? And he said, hey, Sudama, do you remember the evening when our Guru Maharaj had asked us to go to the forest? Actually, Guru Mata had uh, asked us to go to the forest and uh, bring some wood from there. And we had gone there, but we got stuck there because it started raining. And suddenly the whole place got flooded and because of the clouds, it got very dark. So we really lost our way, way back. We couldn't figure out how to get back. So we just stayed under the tree. And then in the morning, our Guru Maharaj uh, realized that we were missing. So he came along with some other students to look for us. And he finally found us. And then he was so happy at our, uh, at our service mood. And he blessed us. Do you remember all that? You know, and they talked about many other similar experiences they had together. And so that was just nodding. Yes, yes, I remember, I remember. And uh, Sudama so said, well, you know, Krishna, <coughs> I always felt that I had nothing more to achieve uh, at the Gurukul because I had you as my friend. <clears throat> and then suddenly Krishna changed the topic. I said, my friend, my dear Brahman, my dear Sudama, did you bring any gift for me from home? And he said, you know, even a very insignificant, the smallest offering from my devotee, my loving devotee, is so appreciated <coughs> by me. And he, he said, basically, he actually, in Bhagavatam, that whole verse from Bhagavad Gita, 926, Pattam Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yome Bhakta Prayachati, that whole verse repeated in Bhagavatam. So Krishna repeated that verse that he had long time ago uh, uh, spoken to Arjun as he was uh, answering his questions at the battle of, during the battle of Kurukshetra. Anyway, so when, sorry, when Sudama heard that, uh, whether he had brought any gift, he was so embarrassed and was really ashamed to offer um, a, a, uh, a bundle of chipped rice. But so he started to hide that bundle that his wife had given him. But Krishna, you know, Krishna is a, a super soul. And uh, what is he? Ishwar Sarbhutana Bhaddeshi Arjun Tushtati. He resides in the heart of everyone. So he knows what everyone has done or what they're thinking. So he knew that uh, um, uh, Sudama is just feeling embarrassed of the present. And uh, he also knew why Sudama has come here all the way from Porbandar to Dwarka. So he reached behind Sudama and grabbed that bundle of flat rice. And Sudama had been trying so hard to hide. And he opened the bundle and ate a handful of it. And as he was chewing it, you could see that so happy doing that. He thinks, thinking this is the most tasty, the tastiest snacks he ever, ever had in his life. And then he was going to eat the second, uh, second uh, palmful of the flat rice. But Mother Lukmani grabbed his hand. She stopped him. And she said, you have given him more than enough. What you've already given him will secure him all kinds of wealth not just in this world, but in the next world as well. 
And she said, not only that, you should also, I mean, you know that a person's prosperity depends upon how satisfied you are with him and his service. So therefore, you know it and I know it, you're very satisfied, so enough. So basically she was saying that, look, Sudama has got enough, actually immense wealth, more than he will ever need because he has satisfied you, my, my Lord Krishna, by his attitude. So Krishna said, okay, fine. So he only had one handful of the flat rice. And then he had Sudama spend the night um, at the palace after giving him wonderful food and all that, Prashadama should say. And Sudama spent the night uh, very comfortably having this wonderful bed. It is the next morning, he set up for home. So now I just want to make the point that Sudama did not suddenly get angry saying, oh, I'm being received so nicely. It is so nice. Let me stay here a few days. He didn't do that. He said, no, the purpose was to, to visit my friend. I've done that. I got to leave now. And next morning, very next morning, he left. But as he was walking along the road, uh, back towards Porvandar, he started thinking, I cannot believe how fortunate I am that I was honored like that by Lord Krishna. You know, seeing all that opulence, he not quite, but almost forgot that he was a childhood friend. He was seeing the present, that Krishna is the Lord of everything, uh, emperor of everything. Sudama was just a poor Brahmin with nothing. Anyway, so and Sudama, you know, even though as far as Sudama knew, he received no wealth from Krishna, nothing actually. But he wasn't going to ask him, beg for anything. So he just returned home, not realizing something has happened. Thinking that, oh, all that happened was I received the uh, friendship and the honor and the joy of meeting Krishna. And I was able to offer something to Krishna and thus enough. <coughs> I mean, all I wanted was uh, some time with him and I got that. And he says, I had heard how devoted Krishna is to the Brahmanas today, or the, yesterday, with my own eyes have seen this. Um, he, he has the Shiva Sureka, which is Mother Lakshmi. He carries Goddess of Fortune, Lakshmi, on his chest, yet he embraced me. And now he got very, very uh, humble. And he said, I'm just a sinful Vijabandhu. Does anybody know what Vijabandhu means? It's a very important term. So Bandhu means a friend. Oh, Rajan Prabhu, did you want to answer that? Uh, I know only partially. I know Dwij is Brahman, but I, I'm not sure about the entire term. Okay, term. sure. So Bandhu means friend. So a friend of Brahman. So basically, uh, as we know, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that uh, the four Varnas, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vashya, Shudra, they're determined by the quality, not by birth. So those people who are born into a Brahmin family, but do not have the qualities or activities of a Brahmin, they're called Vijabandhu. So they're not qualified to be Brahmins, but they're called Brahmins. So now, out of humility, Sudama is saying, I'm not even a Brahmin. Because remember, he's saying, Krishna is very devoted to the Brahmins. And then he's saying, no, but I'm not even Brahmin. I'm a sinful Vijabandhu. But still, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who's full in six opulences, embraced him. So he's just appreciating Krishna's attitude towards, towards him. And he said, he embraced me with both arms. He treated me just like his own brother. He made me sit on the bed of his beloved wife. And because he saw that I was tired, his wife personally fanned me with a charmer. So he's very appreciative of everything that happened. In this life. And then he's thinking that um, all the demigods worship the Lord. All the Brahmins worship the Lord. But he worshiped me as if I'm a demigod. 
he massaged my feet with his own hands. What a humble, menial service he did for me. And he said, maybe Krishna was thinking that if I make this poor wretch, this poor Brahmin, rich suddenly, he might forget me. This, this is Dhamma thinking, that Krishna is thinking that maybe if I became rich, I'll forget him. So therefore, it was his compassion. Out of his compassion, he did not get me, give me anything. Not even a little bit of wealth. This is how Sudama is thinking. What a pure thinking. So it's all the way, he's thinking like this, absorbed this meditation of what happened uh, in Dwarka and what wonderful treatment he got. <clears throat> and just thinking like that, he arrived at Porbandar. The place, uh, his village, I mean. And uh, then he noticed that the place where his house used to be, the hut used to be, uh, it's not there anymore. Like he got real shock of his life. Instead of this whole broken down village with broken down houses and thatched roofs and all those kind of things, suddenly there are all sorts of opulent palaces. He just stood there astonished. And as he was standing there, totally stunned, a bunch of beautiful men and women came forward to him and they greeted him. And they were greeting him with singing and music and all those kind of things. I said, I was thinking, what's going on? What's all this? Whose property is all this place? Uh, how has this come about? Have I come to the wrong place? Like, how, how could I do that? And then his wife inside the, the palace now heard that her husband had returned. So she came quickly out of the house, out of the, out of the palace now, you know, and she looked like Lakshmi herself. And when she saw her husband, he's still shabbily dressed, remember? So her eyes, <clears throat> her eyes filled with, you know, with tears of love, you know, and she was so eager to receive him. So she actually, you know, closed her eyes and embraced her husband in her heart with a, with a close, and then she bowed down to him and uh, uh, caught her, his hand and uh, start walking back to the house. Sudama was amazed to his wife. She was surrounded by maid servants. She, had, she was wearing so much jewelry, ornaments and all that. Uh, she looked like Lakshmi. Anyway, so they entered the house together. He noticed the wonderfully luxurious interior, you know, made of jewels and gems and crystals and rubies and all those kind of things. And he started thinking, wait a minute, I've always been poor. I've always been poor. Um, the only way, the only possible way that an unfortunate person as me can suddenly become so rich is that Lord Krishna has given his mercy upon me. He has glanced upon me with his merciful eyes. And Krishna obviously noticed that I was secretly planning to beg to him for this wealth. So even though I said nothing about this whole thing, he understood and he bestowed upon me the, the highest of riches, the most abundant riches that I can imagine. And he's given it to me all, all of it without me asking even once. So he's, in that sense, like the, the clouds, that pour their rainwater anywhere without asking, do you deserve this? So example is always given, Srila Prabhupada used to say quite often that the rain clouds don't ask the ocean, do you need more water? But they give the water anywhere. Just like they give it to the desert. Anyway, <clears throat> so now I kept thinking about this. I said, Krishna considers that even his greatest benediction is not significant enough. But he magnifies even a small service rendered to him by his devotee. That's the nature of Krishna. Whatever he gives is ah, insignificant. Whatever little bit his devotee does, is, wow, this is huge. That's how he appreciates the services done by 
his, his devotees. And, excuse me, and look at, look at what happened. I gave him, well, actually I didn't even give, I was trying to hide it, but he took a one palm full of flat rice and he accepted it with so much pleasure. And look what he gave me in return. And the Sudama started to pray, my Lord Krishna, please allow me to serve you life after life with love and with great amount of attachment for you and for the association of your devotees. That was his prayer. And Sudama state totally, completely, 108% devoted to Lord Krishna for the rest of his life. Even though he enjoyed the lavish life, but he maintained his mood of attachment. So Yukta Vairagya. And he constantly chanted the glories of Krishna. Sure enough, very shortly after, he left his body and he attained the supreme abode of Lord Krishna. So I'm going to stop again. See if there are any questions because the topic is going to change again. Any comments or questions? Yeah, so my wife is adding that actually Lord Krishna walked Sudama all the way to the most exterior gate of the palace, which is another sign of honor, honoring the guest. Anything else? Okay, all right, so we'll change the topic. Now we're going to talk about how Lord Krishna and Lord Balram met the, the residents of Vrindavan. So this is uh, going back in time. Um, we already talked about how Krishna went back and married everybody, but this is before that. So <clears throat> essentially, Shri Goswami is starting a new topic because remember, Parishit Mahat said, I want to hear about other pastimes. So he's taking this pastimes one at a time and describing. So he said that when, <clears throat> excuse me, when Krishna and Balaram were living in Dwarka, they, they, they found out that there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun, Surya Graha. And uh, I mean, all the astrologers had predicted that, you know, in so many days, it's going to be a total solar eclipse. Um, so the, the tradition is that um, people travel to a place of pilgrimage to take bath in the holy river because eclipse time is considered very inauspicious. So many, many people from all over the country, including many kings uh, and, and the Yadavas from Dwarka, they came to this place, Kurukshetra. So actually, I don't know how many of you know, there's another name for Kurukshetra. It's called Samant Panchak. Anyway, so let's just call it Kurukshetra for the familiarity reason. Anyway, um, this is the place where um, Lord Parashuram, after he got the... Uh, after he got rid of the kings on the earth 21 times, he and that created a huge lake of the blood of these kings. And that's the place, Kurukshetra. Uh, anyway, um, Barasham also, even though he, he doesn't get any karmas, he wanted to uh, make sure um, that he set an example for other people, like common people. So he performed many sacrifices um, for the benefit of general populace. And, uh, and uh, it looked like he was trying to get rid of his karmic reactions of killing so many people, although he didn't need to do that. Anyway, actually that's the, um, Lord Krishna talks about that in Bhagavad Gita. What did he say? Yad yad achrat shrishta tatat evet rajana. Sayat pramanam kurte lokas tat anuvartate. So he's saying that, Whatever the great people do, people follow. So just for that, Lord Parashuram performed this. But that was all done in the place called Kurukshetra, which became very famous um, during the Battle of Kurukshetra. Anyway, so they noticed that all these other kings had also come. 
and not only the kings, many of whom they knew, but also Nand Maharaj, Mother Ishoda, and a lot of people from Vrindavan had come to Kurukshetra. So I mean, obviously the Yadavas were just thrilled to see all these old friends, the kings and all that, but you know, they, they had great meetings, they had great embracing and all those kind of things that went on. Wives met the other wives and men met the other men. And uh, Mother Kunti had come from uh, Hastinapur with, with all her five sons. And uh, Dhritarashtra had come, he brought his hundred sons and so many other people, uh, Karuna and Bhishma and I forget the names, so many other people. They had also come from Hastinapur. Anyway, so Queen Kunti met her brother. What was his name? What is Kunti's brother's name? Hmm? Vasudev. Vasudev. Yes, Vasudev, the father of Krishna. So she saw him after a long time. So she went, and of course, there were other members of the family there as well. So she was very, very happy to see them. But remember, she had been going through some very, very miserable time. So even so she was so happy to see him, her brother Vasudev. She said, my brother, I'm so unfortunate that all of you forgot me during my tribulations. I said, it's so sad that even most relatives forget a person whom the gods don't favor anymore. In other words, people forget the person, even a close relative, when they are going through bad times. And Vasudev said, no, 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 my dear sister Kunti, everything is merely happening due to the fate. We were being so harassed by Kansa that we were forced to scatter from Mathura and take shelter in a foreign land, which is Dwarka. So from Dwarka, there was no way for us to keep in touch with you. So she said, okay, fine, you know, okay, no, no problem. Um, all these other people, I was mentioning some of them, <clears throat> they saw Krishna and they were amazed to see the, uh, what can only be described as transcendental form of Krishna, who is an abode of all opulence, you know, like beauty, wealth, knowledge, strength, etc., etc. And there was Krishna standing there with his, all his consorts. So that he had brought all his wives, 16,108 wives. So people start to glorify um, the Yadavas for having Krishna's association all the time. Then Nanda Maharaj heard that the Yadus were here, including Krishna. So he rushed to the place where they were there, uh, along with all the other residents of Braja, Mother Yashoda included, obviously. Uh, immediately, he just went there as fast as he could get there. And uh, when Vasudev saw Nanda Maharaj, he was absolutely thrilled. He again jumped up and uh, embraced Nanda Maharaj very tightly. Tears were shed and the women met other women, you know, and more tears were shed, you know, but tears of joy. Um, Vasudev, Vasudev was uh, talking to... Uh, to Nanda Maharaj, and he was reminiscing about uh, how he had been, Vasudev had been tormented by Kansa, and how Nanda Maharaj had taken his two sons, Krishna and Balaram, under his protection, even though at that time Nanda Maharaj did not know. Um, Nanda Maharaj, sorry, um, Balaram and Krishna, they came to Mother Yashoda, they offered their respects, and uh, they wanted to say something, but the thrust just choked up completely with emotion. They couldn't say a word. So Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, they lifted their two sons. I mean, these are adults now in their thirties. Uh, they lifted them, put them on the lap and then embraced them. And that embrace relieved them of their whole misery of separation. 
that they've been feeling for so long. Um, Lohini and Devaki were there as well, the two wives of Vasudev. They also embraced Yashoda and they sat down and they were again reminiscing about their great friendship. And they were very appreciative of what Mother Yashoda had done for them uh, by, by raising the two children of Devaki and Lohini. Um, and they said, what you have done for us, this is Devaki and Rohini speaking to Yashoda. And they were saying, what you have done for us, we can, it can never be repaid. Even if you had the wealth of Indra and we gave it all to you, we could not possibly repay the debt that we owe you, that we feel we owe to you. And then Krishna, of course, he couldn't wait. And he approached the gopis in a secluded place and he embraced each one of them individually and inquired about their well-being. And then he laughed and he said, my dear gopis, my dear girlfriends, do you still remember me? It's Krishna asking them, do you still remember me? And he says, he's now he's giving his explanation. He says, it was for my relative's sake that I stayed away so long. I was intent on destroying my enemies and protecting my relatives from them. You may think, or do you? Do you think that I'm ungrateful and you hold me in contempt because of that? And he said, this is, this is the funniest part. This Supreme Personality of God, Krishna is speaking. And he's saying, well, you know, after all, it's the Supreme Lord who brings living beings together and then separates them. And he gave an example. Just as the wind brings together clouds or blades of grass or wisps of cotton or particles of dust and then scatters them all over again. The Supreme Lord did the same thing to us. That's what happened. <clears throat> and he says that he came back to his mood of being Supreme Personality of God again. And he said, generally speaking, if somebody renders, renders devotional service to me, he, he qualifies for eternal life. In other words, he becomes liberated. But you, my girlfriends, my gopis, you have developed a special loving attitude towards me by which you have obtained me. In other words, the other devotees, they obtained my abode. But because of his special loving attitude towards me, you have attained me. And then he reminded him, reminded them of uh, basically the nature of things. And he said, but, I promise you, nothing can ever separate you from us, from me. So from now on, not now on, we were always together, we'll always be together. And the gopis, it had been such a long time since they were reunited, they were united with him. So this reunion, you know, brought them this immense joy, but all they could do was just pray to have Krishna's lotus feet manifest in their hearts. That's the simplicity of the gopis. Well, Draupadi was there as well. Remember I said Pandavas uh, went. So all the five Pandavas and their wife Draupadi was there with Mother Kunti. And uh, she, she went to see the wives of, uh, of Lord Krishna as Lord Krishna was meeting Yudhishthira Maharaj and uh, the gopis. So this kind of thing happens simultaneously in different places, obviously. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So they, of course, they, they exchanged pleasantries and sat down together, wonderful conversation. But then Draupadi said to the wives of Krishna, and she said, please describe to me how you married Krishna. So this is Draupadi asking all the 16,108 queens, 
how they met Krishna and married him. And uh, so Queen Rukmini spoke first, and you have all heard this past time before. But basically, uh, she, she told them that, look, my brother, she, uh, what was his name? Look me, my brother, look me, wanted, and many other kings actually, wanted me to marry Shishupa. And they were absolutely intent upon doing that. They had even convinced my father to, to do that. Give me, give my hand in wedding, in marriage to Shishupa. And at my wedding, the, all the kings, the friends of Sishipal, stood there with bow and arrows in their hand, ready to support Sishupal against any opponent. But my Lord Krishna came and forcibly took me away, just like a lion takes his prey amongst, from amongst the goats and the sheep and all that. So basically she compared everybody else with the goats and sheep. Hare Krishna was the lion. Then Satyabhama said, my, when my uncle Prasen died, or rather killed by the lion, you all know the story about Krishna's marriage to Satyabhama and Jambati. So she says, when my, when, uh, Prasen, my uncle Prasen was killed by a lion, my father Shatajit accused, falsely accused, Lord Krishna of murdering her, his brother. So to clear his name, Krishna went, and there he met Jambuan, whom he defeated, he recovered the Shamanta uh, jewel and returned it to my father. Now my father was very embarrassed. He was very repentant. So he presented uh, uh, the jewel back to Lord Krishna, which he refused. And then he, rep he presented myself as uh, his daughter in marriage to Krishna and he accepted. Then Jamwati spoke and she said, you know, taking from the story that Satyabhama was telling, she said that when Lord Krishna entered my father's cave in search of the jewel, uh, first my father did not recognize Krishna. So there was, he just thought of somebody trying to take away the jewel that his son was playing with. So there was a big fight. And the fight lasted 27 days and nights. And they were pummeling each other. And finally my father recognized only the Supreme Personality of Godhead can be so strong to fight him for this long. And then Krishna showed his Lord Ramchandra form to Jamwan. At which point, uh, Jamwan offered his obeisances to his worshipable Lord, Lord Ramchandra. And he gave Krishna the Samadha jewel and he gave me to him to marry him. Then Queen Kalindi spoke up. And she said that to obtain Krishna as my husband, I performed very severe austerities. And one day, Lord Krishna came to the forest where I was performing austerities uh, along with Arjun, and who asked me who I was. And at that time, I told him that I was performing my austerities to marry Vishnu. And then Lord Krishna accepted me as his wife. And then Mitra Vinda spoke. She said, Krishna, Lord, Lord Krishna, she said, sorry. Lord Krishna came to my Swayamba ceremony and he defeated all the kings who wanted to marry me. He took me away to Dwarka. He married me there. Then Satya spoke. He said, my father, Nagnajit, <coughs> he had uh, made a stipulation that he'll marry me only to the person who can win against seven very ferocious, strong bulls and tie them up through their nose. So Krishna came, accepting this challenge, he came and he subdued the seven bulls at the same time. And then the, the I think the word she used was rival suitors, the, which is the other kings who wanted to marry her. They attacked Krishna, but he defeated them all and he married me. And then Bhadra spoke up. She said, actually, I'm a cousin of Krishna. So Krishna is my cousin brother. My father invited his nephew Krishna um, to the uh, to his place and offered me as his bride uh, simply because my father knew that I wanted to marry Krishna and he gave lots of dowry and all that and then Krishna married me and then finally Lakshmana spoke and she said um, to Draupadi remember Draupadi in your swayamvar there was fish 
as a target. And Arjun had to look in the, uh, in the pot of oil at the reflection of the fish, fish, I mean, and there was a you know, fan kind of thing revolving with only one hole in it. So he had to look down in the reflection and shoot the arrow and go through the hole and hit the eye of the fish. So she said something very similar happened in my wedding. Um, a fish target was fastened you know, to the ceiling, but in my case, the fish was concealed on all sides. Only its reflection could be seen in a pot of water below. And you had to look at the reflection and hit the fish. So she said, many kings tried. Bhim came, Karna came, Jarasam came, even Duryodhana and Shishupal came. They tried to hit the fish with an arrow, but did not succeed. Many kings could not even lift the bow. Some were able to lift it, but not able to string it. So they went away in, in, uh, in uh, embarrassment. And then Arjun came. He tried, but he was able to barely graze the fish. Then nobody was left. So then Krishna came. He fixed his arrow on the bow, looked at the reflection, shot the arrow, and bingo. No, she didn't say bingo. And uh, hit the hit the fish. Um, so that's when I put the garland on his neck. But of course, there were many kings who were very frustrated. So they started attacking Krishna. Of course, he defeated them all. And he took me to Dwarka. And we had our wedding. Now, 16,108 sorry, 16,100 wives, they had to tell their story. So Rohini Devi said, I'll speak on their behalf because otherwise it'll be, you know, past solar eclipse time before they finish with their story. So she said, well, they were all daughters of different kings who had been defeated by this demon called Bhamasur. And this Bhamasur had kept them all captive in his jail. Um, so when Krishna came, he killed Bhamasur and he released all these uh, girls. And they said, we have given our heart and our life to you. We surrender to you completely. Nobody else would marry us because we have been a captive of uh, Bhamasur. So please marry us. And Krishna said, yes, of course. He took them all to Dwarka and married them. So that's the story of the marriage of Krishna to the 16,100 wives simultaneously and eight others. So I'm going to pause again, but this will be a change of topic. Any questions or comments? Okay. I hope the stories are not very confusing. A lot of characters. All right, I'll keep going. It's not totally different topic. Um, but, but the same context. So they were still there and they were all having great conversations. But now all these sages showed up, including Narad Muni, Vyasdev, and uh, they, they knew that Krishna is there. So they came to visit. Of course, when they saw everybody, Pandavas, Krishna, Balram, they all stood up you know, in, in uh, sign of respect to the sages and offered their obeisances to these sages. Of course, they inquired about their well-being and then worship them by offering them arti and all those kind of things. And then nice seat of honor, offer them water, prasadam, etc., etc. Like wonderful reception that these sages deserve. And Lord Krishna said, our lives are not successful because we have obtained the goal of our life, your association. And and he said, even the demigods rarely obtain your association. And we are so fortunate that, uh, that we have got it. And he added, he said, the, the water at the holy place and, and the deity forms of different gods can purify somebody, but only after a long time. However, simply seeing you purifies people. There's a wonderful bhajan by uh, uh, Narutam Das Thakur, where he's, uh, Ohe Vashnava Thakur, where he sings that uh, Gangara Darshan, sorry, 
परस हो पश्चाते पावन दर्शन पवित्र करो सही तो मार्गो इट से ओनली आफ्टर बेदिंग इन गंगा मेनी मेनी टाइम्स दैट वन बिकॉज प्योरिफाइड बट जस्ट सींग यू वंस माई डियर डिवोटी माई डियर वैष्णव वन इज प्योरिफाइड so krishna is basically saying the same thing that we have become purified by having your darshan <laughs> and then he says something very funny i would like that it was funny and krishna has finished by saying that anyone who neglects to honor devotees like you is no better than a donkey so a lesson for us anyway the sages narad muni vyasa etc they heard this wonderful kind words um from krishna and he was speaking like he's just a just an ordinary person so the the, the sages remained silent for a while actually they were bewildered they saying why is krishna talking like that and then they said how amazing is our lord just one second okay ah uh, they said you are amazing you are amazing you're covering your true identity and you're acting like you're human ordinary human and you're pretending to be subject to some superior kind of control you know the all all i can think of we can think of is that you're simply trying to enlighten us and the general public this is really inconceivable and the glorified krishna in that way excuse me for a second sorry so anyway so the sages praised krishna you know like anything and then they krishna offered them obeisances and then they begged his permission to leave ah uh, something else happened i'm trying to remember what was it A- anyway I-, i can't remember there's something else in the in that anyway um and then after after some time everybody left but nand maharaj uh couldn't leave because he was feeling so much affection for his relatives whom he had seen after such a long time so he stayed there for three months in kurukshetra with all the residents of vrindavan and uh, the yadavas were also so happy to have him there they were serving him with so much respect you know um and one time vasudev sat down with nand maharaj and he started to describe how deep his friendship with nand maharaj was and uh how much he appreciated what nand maharaj had done for him and was there such cry is crying just like i was the kept saying i can never repay your debt i can never give you i can never thank you enough for what you did for me anyway so they they stayed together for three months and then nand maharaj left um with some very very fond memories uh and you know they bid farewell to each other they came back and then later on once the rainy season was about to come uh, yadav was also went back to dwarka and they told everybody about everything that had happened in kurukshetra so i'm going to stop for a second again <clears throat> actually it's 929 so i may as well <coughs> excuse me i may as well stop here so any questions comments corrections uh, observations prabhu ji radharani was also there right yes she was mm-hmm. all the gopis including radhani were there prabhu ji i had a question okay thank you prabhu ji thank you for a wonderful class thank and you and as usual sudama charit wo jo hai wo bahut hi uh wo wo dil ko chhune wala wo pura so yes. it was very nice thank you prabhu yes for sure for sure um so many lessons in there uh that 
that whole pastime and especially about krishna's nature and his uh, his uh, um his feelings towards his devotees you know what he will not do like he was willing to give everything he was going to have three pomfuls which meant everything he can start by mother lukmini but he didn't care he was going to give it everything if i one one uh, palm full of flat chipped rice so krishna really means it when he says i don't care the quality of cooking or quality of ingredients all i see is what's in your heart love love the love yes Okay. Prabhuji, Ahaji. Ashwadhamma was also Dwij Bandhu Kaal, right? Yes. Yes. We just read it today again. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm assuming everybody knows Ashwadhamma. He was the son of Dronacharya, who was a Brahmin, although acting like a Chatriya, as a teacher of the Kauravas and Pandavas. So I missed it, Prabhu. You are talking about Sudama. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Whom you are? Whom Prabhu asked that? Ashwatthama. Ashwatthama. Okay. Thank you. No, not Sudama. No, no. He was total, <laughs> total Brahmin. Mixed, mixed Brahmin. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Okay, then we'll stop. Uh, I want to before I finish, I want to thank Ashok Krishna Prabhu for. providing this con milton account uh would have been in some some trouble without that and so we want next... to thank you prabhu ji for a wonderful class oh thank very you very nice very encouraging program thank very you very thank you very much okay everyone one circle one circle for us हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण